person and to our online community on the 13th Sunday of Pentecost and of course Labor Day weekend. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And blessed be God's kingdom, now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy <clears throat> Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> reading from Jeremiah. The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord, come, go down to the potter's house, and there I will let you hear my words. So I went down to the potter's house, and there he was working at his wheel. The vessel he was making of clay was spoiled in the potter's hand, and he reworked it into another vessel, as seemed good to him. Then the word of the Lord came to me. Can I not do with you, O house of Israel, just as this potter has done, says the Lord? Just like the clay in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand, O house of Israel. At one moment I may declare concerning a nation or a kingdom that I will pluck up and break down and destroy it. 
But if that nation concerning which I have spoken turns from its evil, I will change my mind about the disaster that I intended to bring on it. And at another moment, I may declare concerning a nation or a kingdom that I will build and plant it. But if it does evil in my sight, not listening to my voice, then I will change my mind about the good that I had intended to do to it. Now, therefore, say to the people of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, Thus says the Lord, Look, I am a potter shaping evil against you and devising a plan against you. Turn now, all of you, from your evil way and amend your ways and your dreams. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. Thanks be to God. We will read Psalm 139 alternately by whole verse. I will begin. Lord, you have searched me out and known me. You know my sitting down and my rising up. You discern my thoughts from afar. You trace my journeys and my resting places, and are acquainted with all my ways. Indeed, there is not a word on my lips but you, O Lord, know it all together. You press upon me behind me before, and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is so high that I cannot attain to it. For you yourself created my inmost parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I will thank you because I am marvelously made. Your works are wonderful, and I know it well. My body was not hidden from you, while I was being in secret and woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes beheld my limbs, yet unfinished in the womb. All of them were written in your book. They were fashioned day by day, when as yet there was none of them. How deep I find your thoughts, O God! How great is the sum of them! If I were to count them, they would be more in number than the sand. To count them all, my lifespan would need to be like yours. A reading from Paul's letter to Philemon. Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother, to, to Philemon, our dear friend and co-worker, and Apia, our sister, to Archimus, our fellow soldier, and to the church in your house. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. When I remember you in my prayers, I always thank my God because I hear of your love for all the saints and your faith toward the Lord Jesus. I pray that the sharing of your faith may become effective when you perceive all the good that we may do for Christ. I have indeed received much joy and encouragement from your love because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you, my brother. For this reason, though I am bold enough in Christ to command you to do your duty, yet I would rather appeal to you on the basis of love. And I, Paul, do this as an old man, and now also as a prisoner of Christ, of Christ Jesus. I am appealing to you for my son and for my child, Onesimus, whose father I have become during my imprisonment. Formerly, he was useless to me. I am sending him, that is, my own heart, back to you. I wanted to keep him with me so that he might be of service to me in your place during my imprisonment for the gospel but I prefer to do nothing without your consent in order that your good deed might be voluntary and not something forced. 
Perhaps this is the reason he was separated from you for a while, so that you might have him back forever, no longer as a slave, but more than a slave, a beloved brother, especially to me, but how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. So if you consider me your partner, welcome him as you would welcome me. If he has wronged you in any way or owes you anything, charge that to my account. I, Paul, am writing this with my own hand. I will repay it. I say nothing about your owing me, even your own self. Yes, brother, let me have this benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ, confident of your obedience, I am writing to you, knowing you will do even more than I say. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. <clears throat> Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. In the name 
name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Try all different sorts of explanations and interpretations. But there is really no way you can make Jesus' words in today's gospel anything other than what they are uncomfortable and in your face. And as a matter of fact, a friend of mine said, oh boy, Sunday's gospel. Jesus is telling you to hate everybody. <laughs> <clears throat> it's a joke, but because these are Jesus' words, we have to take them seriously. Jesus is traveling to Jerusalem. As usual, he is mobbed by enthusiastic crowds. Some of them want to be healed. Some of them are hoping for a free lunch with a miracle like the loaves and fishes. Some are curious, and some just love a parade. And in the crowd are a few of those specially chosen disciples who have been informed that Jesus is on his way to death. It's doubtful that the rest of the crowd are aware of this. Jesus knew all about mob psychology. He knew that most of these folks were simply enthusiasts, caught up in the excitement of the moment. He was also clear about where following him would lead to. And he wanted them to know what they were in for. Really, he was offering them a kind of informed consent. Whoever does not hate family and even life itself cannot be my disciple. Whoever doesn't take the cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Whoever doesn't give up all their possessions cannot be my disciple. It almost sounds like Jesus doesn't want disciples. <laughs> if you've been in the crowd on that day, traveling with Jesus, and you've heard this, what would you have thought? That the guy was crazy? Other teachers wanted to gather followers around them. Their power and influence increased depending on how many people were in their entourage. But Jesus was making impossible demands. Turn your back on everything you know, on everything that you have and are, and follow me. It will cost you absolutely everything to be my disciple. If there were 5,000 people as he started to preach to them, I bet that by the end, there were only a handful of them, handful left after this. Now you would all laugh if I told you about a church that would allow people to become members only if they dropped their families and if they signed all their worldly possessions over. As a matter of fact, we do have a word for organizations like that. We call them cults. And I'm afraid that it sounds like that's what Jesus <coughs> is describing. And in the early church, it was not uncommon for men and women to take Jesus' words literally and to run off into the desert with absolutely nothing except what was on their backs. Guess what? That is not what I'm going to suggest to you. <laughs> I do not believe that... The Christian faith is a cult. But what I am going to ask you to do is to think about the distinction between being a disciple of Christ and a member of the crowd. You cannot be a disciple without cost. There is a price tag. Some denominations are really worried about whether or not people are going to heaven. We're not talking about that today. This conversation is not about whether or not we are saved, 
as our evangelical brothers and sisters would say. And in any case, I, not being the divine judge, am not qualified to speak on that subject. As I understand it, Jesus' death and resurrection took care of all that. And Jesus will sort out the details of salvation that he promised to us. That is not the question we are being asked here. Acceptance of Christ's saving acts is a given. What Jesus is talking about in this passage from Luke is something quite different. He's talking about what it means to live in the way that he asks us to live as a disciple. This text acknowledges that in the first fervor of experiencing the good news of the gospel, we can become exhilarated and enthusiastic. In those moments, we're ready, like the disciples, to lay down our lives for the sake of Christ. But what about a year later? What about when it gets inconvenient? When your faith annoys your family? Even more, what about when following Christ is tedious? Because it seems like nothing ever changes. Eugene Peterson wrote a book a long time ago about discipleship, whose title has always appealed to me. A long obedience in the same direction. Being a disciple is a challenge, <clears throat> something that you work on every day, even when there are no exciting spiritual pyrotechnics. You may remember a few years ago, a collection of Mother Teresa's correspondence appeared. It reveals that for almost 50 years, she lived day in and day out following Christ, but without any sense at all of divine presence or consolation. She lived that way with the poorest of India's poor, just because she was being obedient to her call. She was a true disciple. The thing about being a disciple is that it has to take priority over everything else. When Jesus warns the crowd that they will have to hate family and friends, he is not telling them that they should cultivate the emotion of hatred. <clears throat> In that ancient culture, some interpreters think the word that we translate as hate meant an expression that implies turning away from, or turning one's back on. So what Jesus is saying is that if you're going to become a disciple, you have to be pre prepared to turn your back on the requirements and expectations of the people around you, even if it will make them think less of you. You must be prepared to give up your attachments to home, job, and property if the gospel requires it. Their claims on you must be secondary to the claims of the gospel. Again, I have the impression that Jesus is warning people off. And he uses a couple of down-to-earth examples so people can't say later, wait, you didn't tell me about the fine print. He wants them to be as careful about agreeing to become a disciple as somebody who will get a mortgage approved before they start building a house, or somebody who will have strong backup before going into gang territory to clean out crack houses. Jesus is serious about this, and so he uses serious examples. What is most important to you in the world? Just take a minute and think about it.
And now take a moment to imagine being in the crowd, being jostled, seeing the colors of the robes and headdresses on the men and women and children around you. Imagine looking at Jesus as he challenges everyone and hearing him say, you, if I ask you to, will you turn away from that precious person for me? Will you sell some stock to contribute to a missionary effort or invest in something with a lower return because it's more ethical? Will you stay in the same old job for a few more years so that you can be a good influence on the company? Will you be faithful to the same man or woman you marry with other younger ones who are available to you? Will you set what I, Jesus, want before what you want? Do you really want to be my disciple? Or do you want to be one of the crowd? In the depths of our souls, some of us may discover that the true answer is, no, Jesus, I don't want to be one of your disciples. I'll do most of what you ask, but there are some things you're asking that I can't do really hard and painful to realize that because we'd like to imagine that we could arise and respond positively to a challenge. But if your answer in your heart really is no, then St. Augustine shows a way to pray about it. He allegedly said to God, Lord, give me chastity, but not just yet. <laughs> so, if in the depths of your soul you know that you cannot pay the price of discipleship, then try praying like this, Lord, I cannot do it. Help me want to be your disciple, even though I'm not there yet. If you are one of those fortunate few who have already answered Jesus' questions in the affirmative and have given yourself over completely to him, you can pray with the Blessed Virgin Mary, Lord, let it be done to me according to your will. And then there are the rest of us, most of us, just muddling along, doing our best, and maybe we're not even sure what our answer is. If I were going to give a title to this reflection, I would call it Yes, No, Maybe. <laughs> if that's the case, and you find yourself in that crowd, then let's try praying like this. Holy One, thank you for the great honor of inviting us to be your disciples. And thank you for the gift of salvation that you have given to all of us. Sometimes I can say yes to you. And sometimes I pretend that I don't hear your question. I ask you to give me strength to follow you, courage to overcome obstacles that people's things for my own self placed in my way, and wisdom to hear what you are calling me to. Most of all, have mercy on me when I fail you. I pray in Jesus most holy name. Amen.
We believe in one God, the Father, the Trusting in God's love for the whole world, let us lift up in prayer the needs and burdens of all God's people, saying, Holy One, hear our prayer. For the church, especially for Michael, our presiding bishop, and Kevin, our bishop, that we may be faithful to the call to follow in the path of Christ. Holy, Holy One, hear our prayer. prayer. For this parish family, that we who are fed at the Lord's table may be strong in doing good for Christ. Holy One, hear our prayer. For protection of the earth, that God will guide us in being good stewards of creation, so that all people may benefit from earth's resources. Holy One, hear our prayer. For all who labor to help supply our daily needs, work to protect us from harm, and inspire us to be better people. Holy One, hear our prayer. For all who are recovering from floods and storms, that God will ease their suffering, give them hope, and strengthen all who work to assist them. Holy One, hear our prayer. For all students and teachers, as a new school year begins, for the poor, the unemployed, and those in need of our prayer, remembering especially Jackson, Father Don, Lisa, Millie, Megan, Jane, Juan, Carly, Cindy, Dominic, Ted, Taylor, Marlene, Lori. Sean, Will, Jamie, 
Andrew, Zachary, Kevin, and I. That they may be strengthened by God's present presence, Holy One, hear our prayer. prayer. For all the departed, remembering especially those we now name, either silently or aloud. That they may be welcomed as beloved children of God. Holy, Holy One, hear, hear our prayer. prayer. Lifting our voices with all creations, with Mary, the God bearer, Margaret, Benedict, and all the saints, let us offer ourselves and one another to the living God through Christ. To you, O Lord our God. God of mercy, hear our prayers and turn our hearts to your Son, Jesus, that rejoicing in the love we know from you, we may be strengthened to serve you in each other through the power of the Holy Spirit working in us now and forever. Amen. Amen. We confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly remain. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways. To the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. 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 May the peace of the Lord be with you always. And all with you. you. goes on, it's going to get darker. So um, please do 
look around and see if you've got something and uh, you can contact me or contact him. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us and offering in sacrifice to God.
By his wounds we are healed. And therefore we praise you, joining with the heavenly chorus, with prophets, apostles, and martyrs, and with all those in every generation who have looked to you in hope, to proclaim with them your glory in their unending hymn. <laughs>
the gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. The body of Christ, the bread of heaven. 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 For one, you have fed us with the bread of life and cup of salvation. You have united us with Christ and one another, and you have made us one with all your people in heaven and on earth. Now send us forth from the power of your spirit, that we may proclaim your redeeming love to the world and continue to pray in the risen life of Christ our Savior. Thank <laughs> you. 